Well, if you don't have a sermon outline, you need one uh, this morning, please lift your hand. Maybe you're new to us, um, not used to having a sermon outline. We do that to uh, study carefully the Word of God and to enjoy what His Word says to us. And so just lift your hand and these guys will be glad to give one to you. We have been talking about youth ministry this morning already, youth ministry overseas and missions kind of together. And in a few moments, I'm going to ask some people to help me preach this message a little bit. So the chairs are going to kind of come back out a little bit. Actually, here they are already, and I'm thankful for that. But this morning, I want us to look at a passage of Scripture that many of us have heard for um, a long time. Um, Maybe we remember this from children's books or we remember this from um, just early in our childhood, we've heard this passage of Scripture where children's ministry comes up. Children's ministry comes up in Luke chapter 18. Um, I want to put some images in your mind just a little bit in the life of our church before we dive into this a little bit. We have active children's ministry. In fact, right now, Um, over in what our theater. Many of you have never been in the theater. You didn't know we have a theater. We have a kind of a a drama slash movie slash teaching theater. Um, It's not, it's just below the helicopter pad in the next building. um, And that's across from the tennis ball courts. So um, just kidding. Um, We don't have a helicopter pad, but we do have a theater and that theater is full of kids right now. um, And they're learning and studying the word of God. Our children's ministry goes for all ages from nursery right on through. Um, There's people that have been teaching this morning. Um, little ones, um, and uh, last, or excuse me, each, each Wednesday night through the school year, um, we have uh, all kinds of programs that are going on that are throughout the building, people that have been uh, very faithful in teaching our children as the children grow up. This is what youth, excuse me, children's ministry look like. Now, don't you love that one? And there's even one more. You got to look at this, you know. <laughs> When you're around kids, you get to really enjoy them uh, in a way that um, we, we, uh, we don't always get to see them in light of that uh, while we're in here. But we remember that children's ministry is going on all around us. Back up one picture right there. I want us to see this. You remember Jim Portisi um, taught for decades in the life of this church, just retired and moved um, up the coast, uh, was in fact here just a couple of weeks ago having an adjustment done um, to his heart a little bit, a procedure done on his heart. But um, Jim, faithfully serving decade after decade after decade. When Marcy and I were in St. Augustine, there was a sister church in St. Augustine called Ancient City Baptist Church, and we had a friend who taught second grade for over 50 years. Um, she taught second grade. She taught half the town. Um, uh, in Sunday school um, during that time, but also youth ministry over in the chapel. So we look at this and we say, what does youth ministry look like? And what does children's ministry look like? You know, what is, what is the result of that? Well, last Sunday, we were reminded what it looks like. Last Sunday, we were reminded <laughs> of what it looks like when we teach our children the Word of God. When we teach our children the way of God, some of you are wondering, what does that picture mean? What is that, what is that, what is that about? T.J. Chipman, who's uh, grown up through his high school years in this church and through other churches before they moved back here to Florida, T.J. Was, was invested in by people in the life of their churches where they were and by his mother and his father as we are seeking to carry out what this passage is talking about. Now, it's kind of interesting we, as we read this passage that we, we look at this, this calling from Jesus to let children come to Him um, and to not hinder them. Um, we see that the early group and the early take on this wasn't too good. Um, in the crowd around Jesus, they, they got an F for their initial children's ministry, and we see that right here, okay? Um, they had the wrong answer. And um, we see Jesus give them the right answer. So let me pray before we read the passage, and then we're going to launch into it very quickly. Father, I do pray this morning that we would carefully look at what you said all those millennia ago when you were looking at your disciples and you were looking at the people around you. Father, I pray that we would listen to your words. I pray that we would see your heart 
Lord, I pray that this morning that our hearts would be touched by the values of your heart. And so speak to us, Holy Father, through your word right now. I pray that we would never be the same as we are even before we read it. In Jesus' name, amen. Notice what Luke chapter 18 says. Very simple, just three little verses. Now they were bringing even infants to him that he might touch them. And when the disciples saw it, what? They rebuked them. That means they told him to stop. You shouldn't do that. Look at verse 16. But Jesus called them to him saying, let's read it out loud. Let the children come to me and do not hinder them for such belongs the kingdom of God. Verse 17 says, truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child what does it say? Shall not enter it. In this text, we see the fact that the disciples got it wrong. They were, they were stopping people from bringing children to Jesus. And Jesus not only stops them from their action, but Jesus explains why they are wrong. And we, be, we get this beautiful look into our Father's heart on this. And so this morning I want us to look at five hindrances very quickly in children coming to Christ. And uh, we see the first one here um, in, the, in verse 15, five hindrances to when children do not come to Christ. Adults, the first hindrance is, Adults who do not recognize the importance of children to God. And that's what we see happening in verses 15, 16, and 17. We see this first part there, and fill this in, that there's the people's faith, and look what it says there in verse 15. Now they were bringing even infants to him that he might touch them. You see, these were, these were adults or these were aunts and uncles. These were people who had seen Jesus. They had heard Jesus. They had seen his power and his work among them. And they were saying, man, bring the kids. Bring, every, bring them to Christ. Let, them t let, let him touch them. Let him bless them in this. And the disciples wrongly stood up and stopped them. So we see the people's faith in verse 15. In verse 16, we see the disciples' folly. This is their foolishness. This is their mess up. They sit there, and they're, you know, they're kind of like the bouncers around Jesus, and they're like, yeah, we're here with Jesus, and, uh, you know, we're, we're part of crowd control. You know, you can just kind of imagine. We, we saw two Sundays ago that they were arguing over who was going to be at his right hand, who was going to be at his left hand. They came to him, and they said, hey, Jesus, when you, you know, when you come into your kingdom, make sure that I'm on your right and I'm on your left. I mean, this shows how much they miss it, Right? And before we judge them too much, I could have done the same thing. I would have been likely to be under the same mentality. We have the benefit of 2,000 years of Christian experience and the Word of God showing us um, the real values that are here. And so we benefit from that. We stand on their shoulders. But at the moment, they blew it. They were very, very foolish in their response. Look at verse um, 15 where it says, And when the disciples saw it, they rebuked them. So it's not just that they stopped them, it's that they stopped them and told them that what they were doing was wrong. And then we see in the next part, we see Jesus correct it. Look at verse 16, it says, but Jesus called to them, to, called them to him saying, let the children come to me and do not hinder, hinder them for such belongs for to such belongs the kingdom of God. This is indeed the very type of person, the very type of faith that God loves. So we see this fearsome requirement. And you can fill this in, the Father's fearsome requirement. What he's saying is this, is that God's salvation in Christ can only be received by faith in Christ alone. 
You see, the disciples were thinking, oh, well, you know, it's, we're, we're elevating one's character and one's, one's actions and all of these things. Children are of low value. They, you know, they, they can't do very much. They can't say very much. They can't, they can't respond very much yet. But really, when they grow up, maybe they will be more worthy to be around Jesus. Maybe when they, when they come along in their development, then it will really matter what they're thinking and what they're, what they're feeling and what they're understanding. But what we see here is that Jesus is saying, no, it's not about what all they can do, but it's about what they believe and who they believe in. And it's about the element of their faith. And it's the fact that they are believing without seeing, that they are coming not with critical analysis that rejects, but they are coming with critical analysis, perhaps as time goes on, but with a heart of faith. And this is what pleases God. You see, the Father's fearsome requirement is that we would receive the kingdom of God by faith not by our works. Fill it in. It can never be earned, bought, or deserved. In fact, I think I left that filled in. I want you to be very clear on that, that the true salvation that gets us to the heart of God is not found in what we do. The true salvation that gets us to the heart of God and into the kingdom of God is a simple faith that salvation is from Him and not ourselves. You see, children are very often better about this than adults. Children are better than adults at having faith in, in some ways. And here's part of the way it, will, it looks and it works. Jesus would over and over and over again make this statement. In fact, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, um, there's about nine times where Jesus talks about the faith of children. Nine times that Jesus is saying the heart of a child and the faith of a child is what God is looking for. Now, I want you to think about that for a moment. Think about the simple trust of a very small child. The simple trust of a very small child doesn't know not to trust in mom and dad. That mom and dad are taking care of them. Mom and dad are going to bring food. Mom and dad are going to, now they may get upset. They may want it right now. They may want some other things. But, but all through, we, we, we see that they come simply believing. And, and, you know, sometimes, you know, whether it's Jimmy Kimmel on late night television or whatever, um, there's, there's even, you know, things that you might joke about, about how much a child trusts their parents. And that, you know, that there's, there are, in some things, probably inappropriate, other things that are appropriate, just, just kidding around and playing around. But it plays on the fact that they believe that mom and dad are going to provide, or that mom and dad are going to care, or that mom and dad are going to watch over. This is the heart that God calls us to have toward him, a simple faith. It's Rather shocking what is said here in verse 17. Look at verse 17. Jesus says this, Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child, have you underlined it yet? Shall not enter it. You cannot go to heaven if you do not receive the kingdom of God like a child. Simple faith and belief in what has been said as true. It's not in your acts of deserving. It's not in what you've given. It's not in what you've deserved. But it's actually all found in the words of God through Christ Jesus. Well, so the first thing is, is that we must see that one of the hindrances is, is that we, that we, do not see the importance of this. But I want you to see number two. There, here's one of the main hindrances. Pride is a barrier. Pride is a barrier. Whereas humility in childlikeness is the key for them, for children, and for you. This is the way we come to God. In fact, 
this passage, look at chapter Luke, and, or excuse me, Luke 18, um, 10 through 14. In fact, these are the verses just before our text that we're looking at this morning. And so the context of Jesus rebuking them about not letting children come to them is within the context of Jesus teaching on humility. And notice what it says here. I've included it here on the paragraph on your outline. Luke chapter 18, verses 10, it says, two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like the other men, extortioners, unjust adulterers, or even this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. Verse 13, but the tax collector, standing afar off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven. And he beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Look at what Jesus says in verse 14. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. Then in verse 15, we see that people are bringing their children to Jesus. The picture of humility, the children, the picture of simple faith, the picture of not being highly esteemed in culture, and Jesus stops them and says, unless you have faith like one of these, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Here he is saying in, these, in this passage we've just looked at, he says, if you think that you're justified by your righteousness, you are wrong, but it is simple repentance and brokenness before a holy God that cries out in faith for his forgiveness that brings our nearness to God. Look at number three, another hindrance of people of children coming to Jesus is this, parental unbelief. This is when parent, parents do not believe, either literally or practically, this is a barrier to children coming to Christ. Now, we obviously would know the first one. The first one, the statement that I want you to see here, is children of parents who do not believe the gospel. And they cannot and they do not hear the gospel at home. Um, the, children, the, the parents, they don't, they don't follow Christ. They don't, they don't believe that Jesus and understand that Jesus is the hope of our salvation. And so they do not tell that to their children. And so their children have to hear it outside the home from somewhere else. But there is another one. That, that is the literal unbelieving um, part of a, ch of a parent. But look at the second one. Children of parents who believe but do not, do not diligently live and impart the gospel are sometimes a greater danger to their children. Really? Well, isn't it better to have a little bit of the gospel than none at all? Well, maybe not. When you have enough of the gospel to cause your children to see that they don't want it because of you, that is a very dangerous place in which to put your children. When they begin to see that, oh, you claim to be a Christian, you claim to know God, to love God, to stand for the things of God, but yet you really don't believe it, or you really don't live it here at home, this can drive our children away from God. In fact, we would call this gospel inoculation. When there's people that, that claim to know God, but they don't live like they know God, and they, they claim to tell their children about Christ, and, and they say that we're Christians, and they come occasionally to church, but they really do not care that their children deeply understand and know the truths of God. This is an inoculation. Some of you say, well, I don't, you know, English is the second language. What is the word inoculation? What does that mean? Think of this. It's, it's as in vaccination. It's that you give someone when we vaccinate someone against a virus, the polio virus, 
Do you give them a bit of the live virus or the dead virus? You give them a piece of the virus that is dead. And so when you take the gospel that is dead in your heart and you give them a little bit of it, it can be just enough to push them away from the gospel. And so um, we want to recognize that the, the gospel needs to be given to our children very carefully so that we do not inoculate them from the gospel, causing them to reject it. There is a fourth barrier that sometimes keeps children from God, and it is the barrier of poor theology, poor theology. This means that what you teach them about God is not robust biblical truth. Um, Poor theology of parents, and I'm going to include pastors and teachers there. Because you see, as we've studied recently in our uh, cults in uh, false gospel study on Wednesday nights, a wrong gospel message, a false gospel message deceives and leads people away from Christ. And so it can be pastors, it can be teachers. In fact, we see much of the New Testament warning us to hold on to the true gospel not a gospel that includes works, not a gospel that plays to other sensibilities like the desire for things in this life, not a gospel that applauds your, um, your certain pedigree of life or your certain abilities or your certain accomplishments, but the gospel of faith in Christ alone. Any other theology can keep our children from God. So, fill this in. The message of the Bible, the gospel, or the message of the Bible is not complicated. In fact, we've boiled down the whole message of the Bible to four words, creation, fall, redemption, glory. As you study the Bible, as you come to know the plan of God, it's simply not complicated. He created all that is. We rebelled against him and fell into our sin. The rest of the Bible is about redemption. And then we see that he's going to make it all right. He's going to restore it. If you just start to read the Bible with those four words in mind, you will begin to see that God is showing us that he is the God of salvation, that he is the God of redemption, and the message is not complicated. But let me tell you what is complicated is moralistic. That means all of the be good stuff, therapeutic, seeking to allow other things to minister to us, Deism, where God is afar off and God is not intimately involved with our lives. Moralistic, therapeutic deism is very complicated. It is very complicated in that we're seeking to live by a certain code and find our righteousness in that. And so that we wrongly teach children the ideas of trying to be good instead of coming to Jesus as their hope. And from that flows anything good that we may ever be is because Christ makes us that. Now, we want to be careful in that. We want to be careful in the message that we're teaching our children. This is the reason that catechistic teaching at home is important. Catechism has to do with asking questions and answering those questions in a biblical way. Catechistic teaching. Some of you went through either a Roman Catholic catechism or a Methodist catechism or a Lutheran catechism. Um, As Baptists, we have not, over the last 60 or 70 years, talked about catechism very much. But we see that catechism is very good. We're not talking about catacombs. We're not talking about burial of dead people as a kid. You know, I was always thinking, oh, catacombs? What do we do? We teach something about that? No, no, no. Catechism has to do with teaching basic theological truths based upon questions. And there's, there's all kinds of catechisms that have been written that are very helpful. The Westminster Catechism, the Shorter Catechism in Modern English is in our bookstore. Look at that. It's simple questions with answers that, get, that your family can, can go through over and over and over again with your children so that as they are having dinner or as they are going on their way to school or as they are about to go to bed at night, that you talk about the questions of faith and that what are the doctrinal truths that we believe. 
as we diligently teach our children, as Deuteronomy chapter 6 says, we see that they learn the truth and walk in the truth. But when parents are too busy, or when a church is too busy to take time to teach basic doctrines, or we're trying to be too cool to take time to teach our youth the truths that they really need for life, then we are appealing to the flesh, and we are not feeding their spirit. And the catechism of the truths of the Word of God is by which we can make sure that our children have not poor theology, but good theology. And a church family needs to do that both at home and when we are together as the assembled body. There is a fifth thing that is perhaps the most stinging that will keep children from God, that will keep children in the life of Sheridan Hills Baptist Church from knowing who God is. Number five is this, selfishness, selfishness that will not serve will keep people from God, keep children from God in this regard through the ministry of our church. Now, he will, he will have his way. He will work his will in people's life. He is going to work. But if we want the blessing of seeing God use us, if we want the blessing of obeying him and our church continuing to do what he has said to do in Matthew chapter 18, that, or in Luke chapter 18, that we would bring children to him, let them come to him, and teach them of him, we will see it. Selfishness that will not serve is a barrier, and it can either be in the home or it can be in the church. You see, if a father is not willing to teach his children, if a mother is not willing to teach her children, carefully, diligently, as Deuteronomy 6 says, when we rise up, when we walk by the way, when we lie down, if, we, if the gospel will not be on our lips, if we will not take time to learn good theology well enough to teach to our children the truths of God's Word, then they will not walk with God. They will not come to the knowledge of the truth. Or if a church does not prioritize the need for ministry among children and teaching them the truth, the next generations will be lost. And we see this happening all around us. I mean, let me just share with you that um, recently, in fact, in the last 12 months, there have been numerous churches that have just stopped by, um, pastors that have stopped by, friends of ours perhaps, um, in some cases, um, that, are, that are here in the, in the area. And uh, some of them have just said, well, how's it going? What's going on at Sheridan Hills? And we talk about how God is, is just moving in our church. Um, our church is being deepened in fellowship. Our t- church is being deepened in what we believe. Our church is being deepened in our missions involvement. Um, there's some great things happening there. Um, people are really connecting and, and not wandering away as much. We were blessed by those. And and uh, they said, well, what, you know, how's, what does your Wednesday night thing look like? What does your Sunday morning thing look like? And we talk about the fact that, man, a, a lot of people come back on Wednesday nights and their children are either in the nursery or their children are in Awana and they're studying the Bible in Awana or they're in youth ministry. Two of the pastors um, of good-sized churches here in South Florida looked at me and they said, yeah, we used to do children's ministry in the middle part of the week, but we don't do it anymore. In fact, last week I heard that another church here in this area announced this, this summer that they're not doing any children's ministry on Wednesday nights. Another one. And I just thought, my goodness, the world is coming at our kids. The world is coming at our families at breakneck speed with inundating tsunami of culture through smartphones and through school and through media and through all of the busyness. And we're going to back off on sharing this? That doesn't make sense. The world's going to win. And so, you know, many of you grew up in a setting where, you know, there was, there was, a lot going on in the life of the church, and there was a lot that you benefited from that. I want to say to you that the answer is not retreat. 
The answer is that we become hardened in our commitment, that we become very diligent, that we press on and not allow the ways of the world to cause us to back off. Um, for indeed, we will, we will lose the gospel to um, the next generations will, will not experience all that God has in store. You, one, of the, one of the things in our cults in counterfeit gospel study that we did was talking about the fact that liberal theology kills churches. And we have a reason to come back. We have a reason to be here and to study the Word together. And I want to encourage you that we need to continue in that in every way. So the question is this. Will I hinder or will I help bring children to Jesus? Will I hinder or will I help bring people, children to Jesus? I believe as a church, we need to be committed to that. I want you to see and hear a little bit about some of the things that are happening. First of all, as they take their place, look at this sheet where it has the grid on the back. I want you to notice this. And this is just really a, a mere numbers thing a little bit. Notice that we have nursery going down, children's ministry going down, and students going down. And I want you to notice this. On Sunday morning, growth group hour, there's six workers that are needed during that hour. For children's ministry, excuse me, that's for the nursery. Um, for children's ministry at the growth group hour, eight teachers are needed during that time. Students, four teachers are needed during that time. Um, for the Sunday morning worship hour, that's this hour, 14 are needed in the, in the nursery. One main teacher is needed along with 10 workers this morning um, over in the children's area. And the students are in here with us, so none of them are needed. That's not applicable. Look at Wednesday evening. For the nursery, we need eight workers each week. For the children's ministry, for Awana, we need one main teacher and 11 workers. And for middle school and high school, we need two main teachers and six to eight workers, um, if we're going to do that right. Now, if you haven't already filled it in, notice this. That's a total of 42 workers every Sunday. 42 workers every Sunday, and 28 workers every Wednesday. Or if you're a quick study, that's a total of more than what? 70 workers every week. Now, this is a valid thing. And you know, I am so excited to be able to say to you this morning, I am not preaching this message because we don't have enough workers. Um, by God's grace, um, we don't have children tied to the ceiling um, in, the, in the nursery this morning. They're not in Velcro suits stuck to the wall. Um, they, there's workers in there with them, and there's workers in with the children uh, during children's church. Um, I'm, in fact, very proud of the way that many of you serve in the life of the church, and you are part of the rotation um, of this. Notice this. We are committed to these things. Look at this. We are committed to physical safety and careful, loving supervision. We are committed, the second one is very important as well, biblically faithful, Christ-centered teaching and care for each, uh, for every age group, training and support of volunteers, sustainable volunteer rotation where applicable. These are things that are important to us. Um, I want to say to you that as we bring our children to Christ, we are obeying Scripture. And I am just thankful for a church who loves children. I'm thankful for a church who loves youth. Um, I am thankful for a church who doesn't say, oh, wait a minute, how much is that going to cost at every turn? We, we, we look at children and they say, you know what? Child safety is important. Let's, let's do whatever we need to do. Let's have the right resources here. Let's have the right things here. This is important because the next generation is important. So I ask you, are you one of those workers? Um, I hope that you are. Now, I know that not everybody can serve in these ways. There's some people that you say, Pastor, if I served in there, um, you, you know, I wouldn't be any good to you because of this or because of that. Um, uh, maybe I, I, my age prohibits me from doing that, or there's a health reason, or there's a gifting thing. I know that different people serve in different areas of the life of the church. I understand that, um, and I'm very thankful for that. But I do want to say, for those of us who are parents and those of us who our kids are already grown, in fact, 
We showed pictures of Meg Ketricide teaching. We showed pictures of Jim Bortisi teaching. These are people who their kids are already out of the, ministry, the youth ministry. They've grown up. They're into adulthood, and here they are still teaching. If you can and if you will, God will bless that as well. So, um, it's just good for us to see what the needs are. How many of you are sh- surprised by the number of volunteers that are needed each week? How many of you are surprised by that? Is that a surprise to you? Okay, uh, either some of y'all are lying or you're not thinking. <laughs> I'm the pastor and that surprised me when I added it up. I was like, really? It takes that much? Wow. And then I look at Gladys and I say, how are we doing? She goes, well, okay, some, day, some Sundays we're doing really good. Sometimes I send them back to the worship service and other Sundays I'm having to call. I asked Laura and she says, we're, we, we have many, but we, we do need some more. Uh, and so really, um, I believe that we've done very well. I want you to hear from them just a little bit. Um, Pastor Lucas, kind of start us off. Any thoughts there? Yeah, I think that we're blessed, and, uh, and I, I agree with you that we, we're, we are speaking to a church that is uh, actively serving. So I want to commend you for, for, your, for your selfless, selflessness in the ministries of, of this church. We have so many ministries going on on Wednesday evenings. I was talking to someone about what happens Wednesday evenings at our church and, and uh, the, the pastor of another church was, was just impressed at how many things go on on Wednesday evenings and on Sunday mornings as well. So I first of all just want to commend you. Amen. And I also want to challenge you because I don't know if you've noticed this, but we have steadily grown in the, at least in the past two years that I've been here. Uh, our, our numbers are, are up and they're not up in spikes. They're just slowly going up. Our children's ministry is growing, so we need more people to get plugged in. So we're not coming to you saying, we're not doing a good job. That's right. We need your help. We're saying, we're doing a great job. Would you consider joining something, that, something powerful, something great that the Lord is doing in the life of this church? So that's what I would tell you. That's how I would encourage you to serve mm. in the life of this church. Amen. Sitting next to me is Billy Johns. Billy Johns, uh, Billy, tell us, how many years have you been working with children in the life of our church? About? 24 years. 24 years he's been working with kids in the life of our church. Isn't that cool? Now, the church pays you a lot of money to do that, right? Uh, I, I thought I, I thought Pat, so I thought Tommy signed a check for you the other day. No, okay. If it's so, you haven't seen it. Okay. So, what do you do for a living? I work for Publix. You work for Publix. Yes. And so you keep fruits and vegetables flowing to our Publixes here. Um, he's in charge of a bunch of produce uh, departments at Publixes all over South Florida. Um, and so we're really thankful for Billy keeping the fruits and vegetables flowing. Now, Billy, um, you've been serving for these 24, 25 years, and you've been a volunteer. And you and I had a conversation when I first came here. I said, Billy, I'm real concerned that you're, that you're often over there, and I rarely get to see you on Sunday mornings, and I really want to rotate somebody else in and all of these things. I was just saying that out of concern to you. Do you remember what you told me that day? Oh, yes, I exactly remember. <laughs> Tell them what you told me. Yeah, you know, Pastor, we're in his car, and he was just like, just looking out for me, you know, and my wife, my precious wife. And um, he was just saying, you know, well, you know, we need to get somebody to help you and everything. And I just looked at him and I said, what are you doing? <laughs> and, and, and the point was is that he's, he's saying that basically, you know, you got to get fed and everything. And I said, I have to be, you know, be bef- definitely being directed and make the intentional to make sure I'm getting fed with a lot of ways in our church so we can be getting fed. But I remember saying that to you. Yeah, yeah. I, I didn't prompt him on that. So that's been, it's going back seven years, our conversation. But it impressed me that Billy was saying, Pastor, 
I'm fed through serving as well. He said, you have to watch that. You have to make sure that you have other mentors and other input into your life. And he said, I have to do that too. But I am passionate about the children in our church. And just as you are passionate and that you are working, I, would, I just want to say to you, for some of you right now, God is speaking to you and he's saying, you can serve in a similar way and you can find joy in that as well. Um, Gladys or Laura or both of you, kind of talk to us about how we can, even though we're serving, how we can be fed, what are ways in which that happens in not missing things? Well, upstairs in the children's ministry, you are teaching if you're doing growth group teaching. So you have to prepare, right? You can't just show up and pretend like you know what you're doing. <laughs> so the, the growth group hour, you're preparing throughout the week to come and teach to the kids. So slowly you're being fed through God's word and now you're gonna get to teach it to these young little ones up there. No one learns more than the teacher, right? No. <laughs> right, right. And then uh, during our worship hour, I've had volunteers come up to me and say that they walked out of there learning being fed. Uh, Josh Crescent is one of the, the guys that usually walks out of there like he, he just heard a sermon down here, you know? He, he's excited about being up there and serving and you're not missing out really because you're getting taught as well. It might be a little bit down, you know, in the sense of a for kindergarten to third grade level, but believe me, as I'm learning, as I'm getting ready throughout the week, I'm learning. I'm, getting taught the word. Um, it's forcing me to read. And then when you're up there serving and doing the crowd control, you're, you're learning. You're singing the songs. We sing, we worship, but we also teach. And you walk out of there with a really good feel in your heart Amen. because not only did you get to serve, but you also heard God's word. Amen. So. Gladys, and then, tell and us. And then there's the Monday message. So if you feel like you missed out on coming on Sunday mornings, then you can hear it at your home on Mondays. Download and then the if, notes. If you're in the nursery, if you want a CD, then we can supply that CD for you so you can pop it in the, in the car anytime you want to listen to it. So if you can't be here, there's just always another way to be fed. Okay. And I understand that we have just activated a new podcast that's coming online next week or something along those lines. So that's tell right. us about that. Yeah. So we just... so. Uh, in about a week, you're going to be able to, to access our podcast, whatever uh, podcast platform you have uh, to play your podcasts. And uh, if you just search Sheridan Hills Baptist Church, our, um, our sermons are going to be uploaded automatically. And you can go ahead and listen to them as soon as they're uploaded. They're usually uploaded by Monday. So, so you can get caught up with us in that yeah. way as well. And they're online and on YouTube every, um, every Monday already, along with the sermon notes. Some of you have never been to our website. If you go to our, SheridanHills.org, uh, you can download the notes either with the answers or without the answers um, and be able to continue to study in that way. Um, but if you, if you miss out, we're trying to make it so that the whole church family can stay on the same page, still be fed, and still do this very important work of bringing our children to Christ. Yeah. There's also the great app that we have now that you could just download and yeah. it, it's automatically there on your phone. So um, I just want to thank all the, the volunteers that we already have. And honestly, this isn't a cry out for help. It's just to let everyone know what we're doing. Uh, just two years ago, I was in the pews and I was getting fed. I was very linear with, with Vic, that I'm sure most of you know. <laughs> um, and we were just there, and God has worked in magnificent ways in our, in our home, in our hearts. And now I'm upstairs with the children, and they're like my kids. I have two of my own, but I have 60 every Sunday and about 65 on Wednesday. So it's really neat to be able to get to know all these children and their families, but also know that what, I'm, what you're doing is not for your own good. It's for theirs and for hmm. God's. So. Amen. Now listen to the woman who just said that. Um, they sat right up there in that balcony spot five years ago, and Vic had told her, We're, we ought to go to that church. We ought to go to that church. We ought to go to that church. They never stopped at the church. 
the, he said, they're always going to talk about money. They're going to talk about money. They're going to talk about money. The very first Sunday that we're here, it was the first time I had preached on tithing. Um, really. I had had three messages out of a hundred that had mentioned giving, but I started a series on tithing the very first Sunday they were here. And Vic sits up there in the thing, and he says, and he goes, I don't believe this. I told you. Those Baptists, are after their money. But they kept coming back, and they kept coming back. And they were living together. They were not married. They have two precious children. And their testimony is that the gospel came and invaded our home. God got a hold of us. He changed us. And here's a couple that have just continued to walk with the Lord and walk with this church family. And now God is using her and has been using her um, for the last few years in, in bringing the gospel. She's taking classes online and in seminary classes. And so it's just a beautiful thing. You, you might say, I don't know how God could use me. Um, maybe I'm, I don't feel gifted, or maybe you don't know where I am. You don't know my struggles. Uh, I would say to you, come and uh, allow the ministry of the Lord to help you grow um, in this. Any other word from either one of you, any of you? I just want to give... I think it's the same <clears> thing. <throat> if, if you have a child in the nursery, in the preschool, <clears throat> I think that if you just devote yourself once every six weeks, that's it. Just once. And it's only one hour, really. So just to come in and be with your child and be with the other child, because we could really use you. And like uh, Laura says, it's not that we're really desperate in need. We do have a vol lot of volunteers. And I do want to say the same thing is I thank you guys for volunteering. Uh, there's so many of you. Like right now, my list is 46 volunteers that I have. Do I need more? Yes. 46. I have 46 of you guys on my list to volunteer on the rotation system. So, yes, I can use a few more. Gladys, tell us how important is communication. How important it is to communicate. Um, you know, people volunteer and they do it faithfully, but sometimes they're out or sometimes they can't make it for whatever reason. Tell us how important it is to communicate. Okay, so when you get on my rotation, we, I plug you into CCB. CCB, once a month, I do a rotation. You'll get a, um, a schedule for the CCB month. CCB being Community Church Builder, which is the site, the, 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 webs, the, the website that we use to communicate with people, right? Correct. And then you will get notified, and it would say, hey, you're being requested to uh, volunteer on July 7th. And then you have the option to say, no, I can't, so to accept or decline, or even there's a spot where it says, I decline, but I want to find somebody to help me or to take my place. So then everybody else in that rotation system will get that email saying, oh, she's looking for somebody. And then all you have to do is accept or decline. But sometimes things will come up, you accept, and you can't show up. So you have, you should, or if you could, just text me as soon as you know that and say, hey, I'm not going to show up, instead of not just sh not showing up. So okay. I have that a lot. Okay. Is that why there's a noose hanging in there? <laughs> uh, oh, no. I'm just kidding. Um, no. Uh, but it really does help her if you will, if you will communicate and, and communicate immediately. And, and see this role as part of us bringing our children to God, bringing our children to God. I wanted to talk about uh, giving our children a faith that they will grow into, not a faith that they will grow out of. We're very, very intentional on that. I hope you're being intentional on that at home. Don't give your children the little Jonah and the whale story and the little this and the little that where Daniel's the hero and David's the hero and, and Jonah, you know, he got, you know, a little spanked by uh, the Lord, but, the, you know, it turned out okay. I mean, we need to be looking at the true message of the whole Bible and all that God has in that. Otherwise, they will simply grow out of the beautiful message um, of the Bible, which we, we don't want to do. We, we do not want to inoculate them. We want to completely empower them with the gospel of Christ and bringing them to Christ. Now, some of you have been praying for Billy. Um, Billy's cancer numbers have gone way up, and um, we are concerned for Billy. 
But Billy has kept his eyes on the Lord. Billy, can you kind of fill us in a little bit on what's going on? You're waiting on what right now? Uh, yes, about a year, February of last, and that's this February of last February, me and my wife, we got, we got diagnosed with, a, I have colon cancer. So I had radiation and chemo and had it taken out. And then I had a scan back in March, and they see a mass in my liver. So... Um, Tomorrow at 2.30, I'll be seeing the doctor, and we're going to find out the results. Um, pastor always asks me, ask what specific thing to pray for, and I told him to bring God the glory. Um, I thank so many people in this church, card ministry, texts, prayers, a little note here, a little call here. I mean, Sheridan Hills is the place, not just for kids, which it is, but for people and for all of us. It's not what you just do on Sunday. It's what you live. You know, it's about God's glory. Amen. And I just want to thank everybody here for your prayers and, and, and pray that God gets the glory and whatever happens. Amen. And, and um, we are so fortunate to be in a church, a Bible-believing church, that, again, tells us to do more than just Look at Amen. a little outside thing. Amen. Bring glory to him. Amen. Billy's faith. Amen. <laughs> Billy, your faith in the Lord and wanting God to have the glory. You've said that from the start. May he be glorified in my cancer. Um, may we uh, see his hand in our lives has been a tremendous encouragement to us. Brother, we are going to be praying that God will deliver you from this. And he will let you stay. And um, we love you and we appreciate your, um, your showing us what it means to love children and to love the Lord. So, friends, um, I want to encourage you to be praying for this man and his precious wife and his, and his kids. Um, Nathan, I'm going to ask you to come to the piano. Uh, I'm going to ask Nathan to, pray, to play for just a little bit as um, we pray for Billy and as we pray about this challenging message that we've had this morning.